Hi, my name is Jake Whidden and I am the Macmillan Education Asia Regional Trainer based in Shanghai. I'd like to start with a story. So when I first started teaching, I was given a textbook by a senior teacher and he said, get into class and teach the past tense talking about holidays. So I went in there and I planned the class and I had everything ready and I went in and I did the class. It was pretty soon that I realized in the class that I had planned for one size fits all and it didn't work. Some students were very good at reading and some weren't. Some were good at listening and some weren't. Some were really good at speaking and some just sat in silence. Some wanted to get up and have activities and do things and some wanted to sit and work individually. This is the first time I ever realized, and lucky for me it was on my first day of teaching, I realized that we are dealing with mixed ability classes. So what are mixed ability classes? It's a term we hear thrown around all over the place. But what does it really mean? So today I'm going to talk about what are mixed ability classes, some approaches to how to deal with mixed ability classes, and finally just finish off with some stuff in a textbook that really helps to cater and shows you how materials can be adapted to, textbook, uh, to mixed ability classes. So, what are mixed ability classes? Mixed ability or heterogeneous classes are defined as classes that have students of different levels of proficiency. And that's the main focus I'm going to look at today. But what we need to realize is that there is more to mixed ability than just that. So let me ask you a question. How many students in your class? 20, 15, 10, 25? Even if you only have three, the same, the same thing will apply to the next question I ask you. How many of those students are the same level? Now I ask this all over the place. I train all over Asia and People often say to me, oh, half my class are the same level, or five are the same level, or even just two. But I only have one answer to that, and it's something that Penny Er said in, in, in back in the 90s. She said that there is zero people in your class that are the same level. Every class has 25, say it's 25 people, that's 25 different individuals all learning in their own different way at different levels of proficiency. So what other things make up mixed ability in a classroom? Things like age or maturity. When you're in a class, I often, we often see classes in adult classes with 18-year-olds and 45-year-olds. That age group is a mixed ability thing. When you're teaching kids, I often see kids grouped at 6 to 8. Now that 8-year-old is a third older than the 6-year-old, so that's a different level of cognitive ability. Things like different levels of uh, language aptitude and intelligence, different ways that they like to learn, different language levels. Another big one, not so big in China, because we usually teach people of the same L1, but for some of you, different mother tongue. That's a different coming into that classroom, especially guys teaching in big international schools or in an international environment. They might have people with Chinese background and some Spanish background, so that's going to affect your abilities of each student. There's different levels of learner autonomy from each student, and the main thing is that students also have different motivations for being in the class. So these are all the things that make up mixed ability classes. When I travel around Asia, I often ask all the teachers in different countries, what are the number one issues you have in class? And almost certainly in the top three, or even usually number one, is that teachers say, my class is mixed abilities. They often tell me things like, uh, the stronger students finish much faster than the slower students. The stronger students tend to dominate the class, can ask too many questions or half the class have finished something and the other half haven't finished something. So these are the things that <clears throat> affect class because of mixed ability, but they are the norm, so we should be prepared for that. What, I've, what is important, why is it important to focus on mixed ability classes is that it's normal. Once we go out into the real world, this is how the real world works. Susan Bremer, in her book, Teaching Mixed Ability Classes, talks about this idea that the biggest stumbling block to teaching mixed ability classes is usually the teacher. I, I don't want to put the blame onto the teacher, but it's just teachers need more awareness of how to deal with this and realize that it is part of their job. But also, if we look at another writer called Adela Simonova, who talks about it in her book called Dealing with Mixed Ability Classes, worth having a look at, 
she highlights this idea that the more aware we are of all of our learners in the class and the more that we have the ability to teach mixed ability class, our students will get far more out of that class. So I just hope some of the ideas that are in this video can help you in your class and some of the extra things that we have attached to this video can help you later. So I just want to talk about this more focusing today on the difference of different levels and also the different skills that people have mixed ability on like reading, writing, listening or speaking. So what can we do? Well, in my 12 years of teaching all over China and meeting people all over Asia, it really, and I used to actually be an observer for the uh, Trinity Dip Tesla practical blocks, and these are the things that I noticed of observing hundreds of classes that really made good teachers focus on mixed ability and differentiate in class. So here are the three things. Number one, know your class. Number two, plan your class. And number three, think about how it works with materials and your textbook. Don't see them as an enemy, see how they can enhance your mixed ability classes. So, number one, knowing your class. How do we know our class? One way is through learner profiles. And learner profiles are very important. Most of us sort of think, oh, we don't have enough time to do them. But if we spend more time doing them, the better our classes will be in the future. So at the beginning of a semester or the beginning of a new class, get in there and really assess how your, the different attributes of your class so you can really plan to make sure that class gets the, your planning gets the most out of your students. So learner profiles are one way to do it. And the other way is this idea of mapping out your class. So this is something I discovered when, uh, about five or six years ago, but it really helped me with really looking at how to develop classes that are mixed ability and how to really plan for those mixed ability classes. So just have a look at some of these graphs here. <clears throat> Over here we have the one, this is called the high proficiency, low proficiency mapping. So I just draw a line after my first few classes and I start to map out how each student fits on that line. And you can see here Lisa is down the high proficiency end, Jimmy's down the low proficiency, and then we kind of have everyone in between. So when we're planning we have a look at that and think, okay, I need to focus on this but I can't forget about these people. Some other ones we can look at are the fast finishes and the slow finishes. Just remember, the fast finishes aren't always the highest proficiency. They might be just less detail-oriented. Slow finishes can be very high proficiency because they're worried about how perfect the answer is going to be. In this one, it's the highly motivated and the lowly motivated. And you can see in this class, people are moving around a bit. In this one, it's the risk taker versus the won't take risks. Sometimes the very high proficient students don't take any risk because they are so worried about losing face. And this is a big thing in Asia. Some students won't want to take a risk because they might lose face. But the ones who do take a risk might move forward. So you've got to think about that when you're grouping. Who, which risk taker will you put with a non-risk taker or will you put all the risk takers together? It's not just the high and low proficiency. The one I really like is who asks the most questions because some kids in class or some adult students, they don't want to ask questions. They kind of hide a bit and they don't really want to do that, but some are always putting their hands up. So you've got your maps now, and you can have a look then visually at what you can do with your class when you're planning. But, but before you do that, you can also add these to your learner profiles. Here's an example learner profile that I use, and I've actually attached one to the video so you can have a look later. But there's, don't just include in your learner profile the grammar and the level that you think, or something their scores on a test. It's many more things in a mixed ability class. It's things like likes and dislikes. Which students work well with which students? Which of the four skills they are good at or not so good at? Which ones? Because not everyone in your class is going to be bad at writing and needs to work on writing. It might be three kids are good at, need to work on writing and three other students need to work on listening. So how are you going to, how are you going to make sure everyone gets something out of that class? You can include your gram grammar, your phonology in there, and importantly, why is each of those students studying? So then you have this nice profile of each student in your class when you're planning. So, now you know your learners. What are you going to do? You're going to plan. Now the key word in planning is differentiation. Differentiation. It's all about this idea of differentiating the outcome for different learners in the class differentiated outcomes. Not every student needs to end up with exactly the same thing. If we end up with every student finishing with exactly the same thing, basically we've said you're all the same, you're not mixed ability and you all end up at the same place. Many people when they talk about differentiation, they talk about differentiated instructions 
And it's more than that. It can't just be how you give the instruction in the class. It's also the outcome of the task. So you need to think about things like, in, at the end of a task, does every student have to have five sentences? Maybe one, one student who's very high level needs to have ten sentences, and one only needs to have two. You still have the same form in there, or the same function, or the same grammatical item, but different amounts of work are being produced by different people. You might give a time limit to some and say, you have ten minutes to do it, you have three minutes, but the three minute people have to do it five times or something and try and speed up and get better at it. There are many ways you can differentiate the outcomes in class. We'll have a look at a few more. So how can you do this? You need to realize that in control practice and free practice, it, it doesn't have to just be one size fits all. As I've said many times, you need to have them thinking in a control practice, for example, you're doing a controlled dialogue, but this group are the higher level guys and they're gonna do 15 different versions of the dialogue, but this, these two guys are just gonna do two versions of that guy. The point is that everyone in class needs to reach I plus one. You should look up Stephen Krashen's theories on this I plus one, but it's input plus one. They need to be moving up. If they come to class and just practice something they already know and they're already using it, they're pretty much wasting their time in that class. They can do that out of class. So let's have a look at one more graph. You'll soon realize how much I like graphs. So here's a graph. On the y-axis we have the proficiency, and over here we have all the students plotted in my class. Now here you can see the level or the aim of the class. And when I observe classes, what I notice is a lot of teachers want to get everyone to that one key point in the class, the aim of the class. But if everyone gets to that level, what happens? All the bottoms people, they move up. And that's great for them because they learnt something and they got to the aim of the class. But what happens to the top guys? Those guys, well, they have to come down to the level of the rest of the class and just practice something they already knew. So what did they really get out of the class? The key is to think before your class, how is everyone going to be moving up? And that means they're all getting their input plus one. So one of the easiest ways to differentiate outcomes is to allow for personalization in the class. Personalization is this idea that students can choose the outcome of an activity. They still have to include a grammar point, or a form, or a function, or a certain phonological issue, but they get to choose maybe the extra vocabulary, or how the presentation is going to work. Some ideas for that are letting them choose the, and write the ends of dialogues, or adding in new vocabulary and topics into a dialogue that you've given to them in a controlled practice. Let them choose the topics for their presentations. With kids, it could be as simple as just letting them draw the picture they want to draw, rather than you telling them what to draw. Um, letting them add into a role play, letting them add new characters into a role play. All these things allow for them to personalize it. The other thing is talking to each other about relating the topic of that class and how does it, what does it mean to them and what is the, the why factor for them. Because when you have open-ended questions like that, you're allowing for personalization, the students will want to do it more, but what's really happening is you're allowing for differentiated outcomes. And that's how we start to deal with mixed abilities. There's another point we need to make here is about grouping. I just want to do this as a quick side note. People always discuss this idea of grouping and mixed ability, and we can either group as heterogeneous or homogeneous. Homogeneous means grouping all the people of the same, roughly the same level, very roughly, together. So we might have three, 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 and three, and these are the higher, middle, and lower. Or heterogeneous means mixing them with a high and a low. Now, most schools I go to, they say, oh, I like to mix heterogeneously because the, the higher level guys help the lower level guys. But what the problem with that is it makes a real issue for the teacher because you kind of relying a lot on those high level guys and they end up teaching the other ones but what else do they learn? They solidify their own knowledge but they don't get pushed as much. My argument would be mix it up a bit but I, I tend to go for homogenous grouping because it allows the high levels to really push each other. And as a teacher, it means you can be over here focusing with the low level guys, you've got three things for them to do, but the high level guys, they, those guys have got 10 tasks to do and a much broader range of what they have to do. So it means you can really set up your class to be catering for everyone. The other thing is never be afraid of individual work. I think individual work became a bit of a no-no in communicative language teaching, but Individual work allows every student to work to their own ability. So when you're doing an individual writing task or even just an individual 
uh, reading or something, you're allowing each student, even if it's just a time limit on reading, each student has their, they will finish with their own outcome and each student pushes themselves. Individual work really allows for mixed ability in the class. So let's move on to textbooks and how these can work. When you're creating a new task, as I said, you need to create different outcomes. So in the class, you're thinking, OK, there's a fast finisher. I need to create some extra work for those fast finishers. By the way, there should never be a fast finisher in your class. It should be preempted. If you're creating one worksheet for the, the class as a whole, then you already must know, because you've done your learner profile and you've done your mixed ability mapping, you already know that some students will finish first. So rather than waiting for them to finish and say, teacher, I've finished, and now you're sort of pro, uh, reactively giving them the work, do it preactively. Sort of say to them, hey, guys, um, here's the thing that you're going to be doing. Here's your task. By the way, if anyone finishes first, if anyone finishes fast, up here at the front, here's this extra activity. Come up and see me and get it. So they know that before that. So you should always have something prepared for that. So now let's have a look at a textbook. In a textbook, a lot of textbooks sort of focus on this idea of everyone's going to fit in their, in their one-size-fits-all. This is the final outcome and you're all going to work together. I know many now include personalization, which is great. It's a big step forward in, in allowing for differentiation in class. Have a look in this textbook. What we tend to have is in classes, we have a speaking activity and then we have a listening activity or we have a writing activity. But we all know with the four skills that these guys might be good at writing and these guys might be good at listening. So how are we going to combat that with one scope and sequence? How are we going to do that? Well, in this, in this book, which is called Breakthrough Plus, uh, it's a Macmillan book, it's, it has this excellent idea of a two-tiered approach. And this two-tiered approach is they have the core subject or the core uh, curriculum, which is the first few pages of the text. And in there, we make sure everyone can do it and we allow for some personalization and there's some outcomes of task. Then we've finished all of that and we've done this vocabulary, grammar, some pronunciation, and that's nice. And so just say we have uh, Jason here. This is Jason. Now, Jason was really good at vocab, grammar, and pronunciation. What he needs to work on, though, he needs to have some more writing and some more listening. So what this book allows you to do is go into the tier two or the expansion pages and pull out some more writing and listening. This is Lisa. Lisa, what she needs is some more listening. So then we can think about how we can focus on some more listening for her. And then we have over here Rebecca. And Rebecca, she was really good at writing, listening and speaking, but she needs more reading. So how are we going to do that in class? So if you finish the core pages and then you can start to set up your class in different little pods and think, OK, I'll set up these guys to do some listening. You might have to do that on a separate laptop or something. You can set up these guys to do some extra speaking task over here and these guys to do some writing. And this allows for everyone to be developing the skills that they need to develop. And then everyone gets something out of class. This is a two-tiered approach to how you teach a class. Now, many teachers will say, that this means more planning and more things to do. But if you have a textbook that allows you to do that, it's just a matter of grabbing those resources and changing your mindset to thinking, no, when I go to class, they are all different levels, so I need to be able to do that. Then what you become through your monitoring and walking around the class, checking on each group, is you become the conductor. And I really like this idea of thinking, as a teacher, we're conductors. We're not going in there doing a one-sided thing. We're trying to control the violins and the, and the bassoon and the trumpets all together so they make some beautiful music. So that's what we're doing. We have this group over here doing one thing and their outcome is different to this one. And what our role becomes is we're walking around monitoring, giving input, giving some feedback, becoming real teachers, listening to what they have to say, taking notes, and then thinking about how am I going to integrate this into my next lesson. These are all the things to talk about mixed ability classes. The ideas of differentiation, personalization, doing learner profiles and getting to know your class, and then using your materials to benefit the mixed ability class because it is the norm. So, thanks a lot for watching the video today and this small talk. Check out the links below for some other ideas. There's also some handouts and some PDFs. I also attached the learner profile that I talked about. You can download it there. If you have any other further questions, you can email us at the email address below. Looking forward to hearing from you soon, and keep on watching our small talks. Thank you, and bye-bye. <laughs>